Next up, we're going to have Dr. Wilson. All right, thank you. Well, we're really uh, happy to have everybody here and those who are online and uh, really, really uh, appreciate uh, kind of the community involvement and the interaction with you guys. Um, so we're going to talk about Little Leaguer's Elbow, and a lot of this is going to be broad strokes because it's familiar to you guys quite a bit, and then we'll just kind of talk about some concepts. You know, the term Little Leaguer's Elbow really encompasses pathology on the medial and the lateral aspects. So medial epicondylitis, an epicondylar avulsion, a capitellar OCD or ulnar collateral ligament tears, and, and they kind of occur in that order temporarily, and you can see the stress pattern that occurs on the elbow there with throwing. And so when we think about throwing, the throwing cycle is a very, very specific uh, biomechanic cycle. To be efficient, pitchers all kind of gravitate toward almost the exact same motion. And it puts that arm and that external rotation and valgus and puts some unique stresses on the elbow. The Problem is in Little League, the elbow looks like this on the inside. There's lots of these little growth centers. And so those little sh uh, sort of diagonal shaded lines that, that's the ossification center of the bone within the developing cartilage. Uh, and so that's an immature structure, and it's really not designed necessarily for the type of loads, both kind of direct loading as well as shear stresses that can be placed on it during that throwing cycle. And so when you get the arm in this position and you get that medial tension, lateral compression, and there's some shear and rotation that goes into that, these little growth plates are all under a lot of stress. And again, it's not necessarily the growth plates, but it's the interface between the cartilage and the bone that's developing inside. Um, and so the problem is not one or two episodes, it's repetition. And that's the theme that, that we have this morning. But this is kind of a classic example of repetition. And it's pitch volume, uh, year-round participation, sort of the, the you know, trying to play on a select team where there's so many games being played over a short amount of times. And then kids that are really good end up pitching and catching. And so it's just a volume problem of the stress on those little structures. And the literature has really continued to bear this out. This has been something that we've known for a couple of decades, but you know, really a negative relationship between all numbers of pitches and future performance. And it's volume, not just in a game, but over a season. And so this is a classic example of just too much over a sustained amount of time. And when kids play at earlier ages, when they play for longer periods, those are positively correlated with some of these injuries that we're talking about. And we see some of these happen, some of these injuries really peak at an age where kids are really have those really immature structures in their elbow. So it's basically just these forces are across a very immature structure. So the history is really important. You have a loss of velocity that you, you can look back and talk to families and talk to kids. And so th these are things that are really r easy to recognize if you're looking for it, if the coaches are looking for it, if parents are informed. So education is really one of the most important things. Looking for loss of velocity and loss of control, those are functional things. As the elbow starts to have problems, the kid may not even know why it's happening. And then the elbow will lose extension, and that's often a silent problem. And kids will, you know, in retrospect, you ask them and say, oh, yeah, it's been a while since my elbow would straighten. Uh, you know, I just kind of ignored it a little bit. And then they develop medial pain after throwing. They're fine during the game, and then it hurts later. And then they get pain with throwing. And then sometimes there's a, a sentinel pop while they're throwing or mechanical symptoms. And it really is kind of occurs temporarily in that order from top to bottom. And so what do we see on exam? We see that loss of elbow extension. You look at the elbow of the throwing arm compared to the contralateral side and it's lost extension. The whole joint is inflamed. There's some synovitis, there's some tension in the, in the flexor musculature and that, and that causes a flexion contracture. They have medial pain and that again is temporal. At first it's over the flexor muscles, then it comes to the medial epicondyle itself and then the ulnar collateral ligament and you can exhibit some of that or provocative testing with valgus stress testing on those structures, you can kind of find that point tenderness. When it's epicondylitis, it's in the muscle belly as it gets to be um, more of a periosteal or avulsive change than it goes to the epicondylar uh, insertion. And then kids who have capitellar problems, they just have posterior lateral vague pain and sometimes develop mechanical signs. So beyond the physical exam, again, history, physical exam, we start to sort of, you know, say this is pretty clear, you know, how's your elbow moving? Do you have mechanical symptoms? Do you have a pop? 
Um, and so sometimes imaging is warranted. We see medial epicondylar avulsive changes on the x-ray. You can see capitellar radiolucency with OCDs. And then, of course, advanced imaging. Um, we, we can use ultrasound for quite a bit of this, but the gold standard remains MRI to really see not only the, the ligamentous structures, but also the uh, avulsive changes that can occur. So overuse, the answer is always rest. Change the pattern, uh, decrease some of the stresses. Uh, so we put these kids into forced rests, and then we do scapular and shoulder and forearm strengthening, shoulder stretching. We work on form. We work on throwing limits. Um, surgery, when needed, uh, we can address the evulsive changes of the medial epicondyle. We can address uh, the capitellar uh, osteochondral problems and ulnar ligament reconstruction. Uh, these are big surgeries. They put kids out for quite a while, and most of our literature shows that kids have trouble returning to the same level. So prevention is the key. Um, you really want to look for the problem, right? I mean, it, it's pretty easy to find if you're looking for it. So it's a, it, kids that get this have a history of a high volume of throwing. Uh, they're kids who talk about a previous injury or having uh, arm fatigue at times. And so it's really just asking these kids, training the coaches, working on proper form, working on progressing their mechanics before they try to throw too much or too difficult of pitches. Uh, this is a concept that just visually is a really nice one to look at. It has to do with your pitching mechanics. Oral Hersizer there on the left is, was known for great mechanics. He had a long career. And um, Sandy Koufax on the right had a very, very short, brief, uh, wonderful career, but very short. And you see where their hips are, and you see what that does to their upper body. Many of you are therapists or um, athletic trainers it kind of understand that concept. It puts the shoulder girdle and the elbow in a much less advantageous position. And this is what kids look like when they're young. And as they start to get a little bit better, their rotation and their mechanics change. So that doesn't look very good at all. It looks like it hurts. And that looks a little bit more athletic. And that's what we're looking for. And there's been multiple studies talking about how the lower body affects upper. So for prevention, we work on the, not only the form, but on the uh, mechanics and the strengthening uh, uh, with the therapy team. Uh, pitch counts are very important. Again, this is a volume problem. And so you attack the whole problem in terms of how much they're playing on concentrated teams and specialty teams, but also the pitch counts within individual games, and that's been shown to be critically important. So we put them at four stress. Uh, we want to rehab them, strength and stretch. We want to evaluate their form and then th put them into a progressive uh, throwing program, and they have to have no pain when they go back. So finally, uh, education, I think, is really the key for this problem. Uh, you know, all of us, particularly parents who, who are now kind of hovering on the front line of their kids. Uh, so, you know, no concurrent pitching and catching, uh, really looking at throw counts or seasonal throwing volume, uh, really extreme caution with year-round play and select teams, and look for elbow uh, uh, loss of extension and, and ask kids about the pain. Those are, those are pretty simple concepts, but they go a long way uh, for prevention for this problem. All right, whirlwind tour of the elbow. Any questions? Fantastic. Dr. Ellis. <laughs> Any questions for Dr. Wilson? Dr. Ellis yes. does have a question. Yes, Actually, I'm going to skip Dr. Ellis for a minute. <laughs> uh, so we know that pitch count is the most concerning, but are there certain pitches that ages that you're worried about or that you see more prominent? Yeah, you know, interestingly, you know, people have looked at type of pitch quite a bit, and I think I had it in here somewhere. But basically the answer is um, it's volume mm -hmm. over type of pitch. And there used to be a lot of concern about curveballs or breaking right. pitches. But when they started to look at that, what they really found was the correlation was the kids who were throwing breaking pitches at an early age were just really good throwers, mm -hmm. and they had a high volume. And when they looked at, mm -hmm. at the curveballs versus the volume, it's the volume that was the problem. And so it's not, you know, there, I'm sure there are, you know, there's always cases where it was a particular mechanics problem, yeah. but the answer is really the kids who are at risk through those breaking pitches because they were good at an early age and they had a huge volume of pitching behind that problem. Um, as far as technique, do you see, or I guess more injuries based on somebody that has um, like the side releases? 
Yeah. Those. <laughs> yeah. So the mechanics are incredibly important. And, you know, there are people who, you know, you see these odd mechanics at the upper levels of college and major, you know, but those are the small little numbers at the bell curve. Most people fall into a very, very narrow range of their mechanics because um, once you get out of that hip rotation sequence or how far your arm comes back, you start to put so much stresses there that the number of kids that fall by the wayside with those odd deliveries are astronomical compared to the few that you see that, that, that make it. So yeah, it's a pretty narrow window of appropriate mechanics, yeah. All right, in the interest of time, I think we'll move on. Thank you, guys.